Uh, we have about 45 minutes for um, discussion, but a hard stop at 4.35, just to set the stage. Uh, and I invite uh, anyone who has a question to please come up to one of the two microphones that are um, situated in the aisles. Uh, and I'll keep my introductory comments to uh, a minimum, and I hope that sets the example. Uh, this late in the afternoon, um, being succinct and valuing brevity uh, takes on even more of a premium. Um, so with that, let's just kick it off uh, to questions. And um, I see George has our first question. Yeah, I, uh, I don't mean to dominate things. In fact, I'm going to probably end up leaving early because of the storm coming in, and I've got to get out of town. But um, I would like maybe several of the panelists, or all of you, to posit the question how different things would be if children could vote. We, talk, uh, we find ourselves in a situation here with, uh, with uh, uh, Medicare and uh, our health spending, really favoring older people. If you think about it, uh, it favors uh, care for uh, advanced uh, illnesses and, uh, and, uh, and, and lives of people that have already incurred uh, a lot of uh, society's problems and, 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 and health conditions that have risen the cost of care. And uh, we've devoted an, uh, our, our health uh, system to serving the needs uh, more of adults more so of adults than of, of children overall. And as we think of the social determinants, um, our better advantage is going upstream and younger uh, if we mean to change the trajectory for, uh, for health and for population health overall. Uh, and we're trying to discuss uh, value and return on investment with systems whose uh, income is derived and whose attention is focused on adults for, by and large. Um, working with youth will get you a different answer in terms of what does your community need, whether it's spending on community benefits or what are your priorities, uh, what can we do here to make things better for you health-wise uh, or, or, or uh, lifestyle-wise uh, or uh, productivity-wise. So if you could each postulate that question, how would things be different if children could vote? That is where our future is. I'll start. Okay. So, so. Uh, great question, Dr. Flores. And I look to some of the activities that we've implemented in CPPW and CTG with, with schools, um, creating uh, the opportunity to increase physical activity in schools, but through focusing on the wellness programs, not only for uh, schools, but also for daycare. So if children could vote, because I think children like to play, and, and play can be useful and beneficial, and you can incorporate play into daily classes. Actually, because we had so little time, our Chula Vista School District, because of the passion and will of the superintendent, has uh, implemented strategies before they got the CPPW grant from us and now the CTG grant to focus on physical activity. But because of that, in just two years, they have significantly decreased obesity and uh, obesity in that entire school district. There are still some hot spots, but in two years, they have made significant contributions. And they enlist, they make changes, systems and changes in the school, but also they engage the parents and the children become vehicles to help educate the, the, the parents. So for me, the focus would be on um, the wellness, implementing wellness policies at schools and, and for daycares as well. I, I think it's a really great question um, too. And you know, my immediate um, response is uh, reflecting on a photo voice project that we worked on. And we did this photo voice project with youth throughout um, California. Certainly there were Central Valley sites, but we, we went out to external places to do some comparison. And there was this one image that kept repeating over and over, no matter if we were in up in Arcata or in the Valley or in Santa Ana. And it was of children, of youth capturing their friends jumping the fence to get into the lock school um, grounds because they were often the only green space in their community that was available for recreation. And overwhelming, the, the same comment was like, you know, we don't understand why this is locked. Why can't we use it? It's just being underutilized. And if it was open, we'd use it more. Um, and 
And there was a really intriguing comment about um, one of the youth who had actually been fined for jumping the fence. And it really began to get me to think about how just in the act of trying to find a safe place to play, um, it, it was being criminalized, right? And so I, I think about how unfair that is um, for them, just their desire to want to be physically active. Um, I had a very similar incident with my son who I was encouraging walking and uh, he actually uh, got cited for crossing in a crosswalk uh, because he was impeding traffic and how discouraging that was to him and you know him coming back to me like I, I don't I don't want to be out walking more you know I'm gonna get pulled over and ticketed and we fought the ticket and and of course he won and it was dismissed in the interest of justice but but I think about that and um, a lot of the comments that we get from youth about um, sort of the, the unfairness of opportunities that exist um, for them. Um, I'm also heartened about how they take that into action. And in Edison High School, they created a healthy snack shack. So they um, only were selling um, healthy, nutritious items, and they eliminated any sales of sugary, sweetened drinks. And this was all a youth-led activity. Um, and I'm also heartened by the work of youth in Fresno who are drawing more attention to the overt marketing of unhealthy products to, to them and their peers and um, how they're developing sort of a truth campaign similar to the tobacco efforts to draw attention to this. So um, I think that youth engagement is very powerful and that they're very innovative in, in terms of how they're trying to address and help inform us about what their needs and issues are. I just wanted to add that I agree with what the previous um, panelists have said. I guess I wanted to make two related but different points. I guess the first is I think if there was more focus on children, there'd be more focus on prevention and population health. Because children are not just little people. They have developmental needs, as I think all of us know, that, that you know, where, they really, we, where our goal should be to prevent uh, future illness and to help them grow up healthy and support them. And so I think you know, you'd have a system that was much more focused on health promotion and, and disease prevention. Um, I think one of the things that really works against the focus on, on kids, uh, coming from an organization that focuses on kids, is that um, e the triple aim, however wonderful it is, in trying to focus on reducing costs, improving health, and I improving the patient experiences, that the focus on costs necessarily means that, because children are not driving the costs in our healthcare system. Adults are. Uh, long-term care is other other things are, and um, and so if if we if we stay focused on costs, I'm not saying we shouldn't. We should, but if we stay focused only on costs, then then children will never be at the table because they're not the cost drivers. Um, so I guess that speaks to when we think about the triple aim that we really do need to focus on the population health piece and include children as a piece of that. And, th and then maybe we'd have a more balanced approach. Uh, because even the, the, and however wonderful CMMI is and the, you know, the great stimulation that's going on with their Catalyst funding, um, it, it's terrific. And, and thanks to the leadership of, of Jim Hester, who's on this panel for all that he's done in that area, the, that the way the, 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 the FOAs are structured, you really have to get cost results in six months, six months, 12 months. And it's hard then to come to the table with an innovative approach like my, that my colleague was talking about, because that's not going to get immediate costs, or cost savings. And so there's, in a sense, a bias in the focus on costs that, that means that you end up focusing on things like, what, which we did, which is on asthma. Uh, because that's where we had high costs and they were going to the ER and we can look at that. And, not, and those are all great things, but I think it then precludes a, a broader discussion that, that, that I think you're talking about that, that we ought to have about children. Just a brief addendum on that. It, it's a perfect example of the limitation of the existing savings sharing model. There is a focus on kids, but it's the high cost kids. You know, being able to get programs to support the broad you know, child development issues uh, will not happen under a pure savings, just a shared savings model. We'll move to the next question from the, the gentleman here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Terry Allen. I'm from the Cuyahoga County Health Department in Greater Cleveland and also NACHO. Uh, this question is for Genoveva. I, I was struck by um, 
by uh, your presentation and what appeared to be this little transfer of power and decision making to local communities, to people in, 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 you know, in, in their schools, in their environments to, to drive the change around social determinants, it makes a lot of sense. We're talking about payment reform on a grand scale and the time it will take and dollars available for population health. Can you talk about how much of what you're doing is happening without external funding resources, just by sheer will of force uh, in the communities you are working with? I think that's an important point. Yeah, thank you for asking that. Um, I, I didn't cover that. Um, so these 200 leaders that we trained got $100 each for a year's worth of work, you know, minuscule. Um, some of the efforts that they have moved forward um, uh, as an example, the walking group uh, in Bakersfield, there's no cost to be involved in that walking group. Uh, the aerobics, I think one of the residents bought like a $7 CD and learned the routine and has been teaching people that routine repeatedly, you know. Um, the um, park in Pixley uh, was a battle. Um, and just to elaborate a little bit on that, it was a battle because in this community of Pixley, there's largely new immigrants. And the decision makers around the park felt like um, it wasn't a worthy investment to bring any more amenities to this park because it wasn't their constituents who would benefit from it. And um, we fought against that. And in the end, I think they spent $1,000 to site two goal, goal posts for a soccer field in a, in a, a park that had a lot of vacant um, grass land. And within six months, there were over 200 youth that were organized in a youth soccer league. You know, that's huge return on investment for me. Um, when we've done um, policy and environmental change efforts, uh, there have been um, a, a lot of big rewards for that work. And I think about the acceptance of electronic benefits transfer at flea markets that we worked on and how um, what ended up happening was that they have a sales of over $10,000 a month just on their fruit and vegetable vendors as a result of that advent, right? Like that innovation really opened the doors for residents on um, CalFresh to use their benefit there and how that is supporting the vendors to continue to do that work and that's trickling back into the local economy, right? So I think that there are a lot of examples like that, but um, there is still a need for investment in terms of um, having the organizing ability to do this leadership development with residents. And um, our project was funded, as I mentioned, by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. It was a matching project. They gave us um, 400,000 over four years. And um, we were building the ship and flying it. So as we were developing the curriculum, we were incorporating community resident doing the leadership development trainings that they actually helped to inform in its finished product. That's a great question, because I think the other thing you're, you're bringing up is this concept of what I talked about earlier was integrators, the, the, the backbone folks, the leaders, who, I mean, they're all over the country. And one of the things I think both the CDC grant and the CMMI work and, and other opportunities that ACA have, have done is, you know, given stimulus to those folks to do, you know, great work. I think a challenge, a, a benefit that we could focus on is how do we create a system that, that empowers those people so that they can continue to do these kind of, this kind of work. And so the idea of having, um, if they work in the Medicaid area, having those professionals being funded you know, by Medicaid, that's, that's one idea of a, uh, a sustainable financing mechanism. But how do we continue to have folks, like you're talking about, continue to do the good work they're doing? Just one add-on that I didn't mention was the fact that if I were to calculate all these hours that community residents contributed, the in-kind would be phenomenal, right? And um, this work, both the crop work and our sister project in HIAC, really were the foundations that um, I think drove a lot of investment into community transformation grants. So um, the public health department engagement that was there for HIAC and crop built their capacity to then be able to respond to this application. So that was a huge in investment in building um, and bridging off of the initial work. Sana? Hi, Sandy Magnan from ICSI. So my comments and questions are directed at Jim and John here. Um, it's troubling but not surprising that population health, 
in health care is kind of getting crowded out, either with total cost of care and patient experience focus, or it's just too difficult to try to focus on it and measure it. One of the things that we've talked about in Minnesota has been, so if we were to focus on creating like CDC healthy days measure or promise measure, some kind of global health measure which you hope gets you closer to population health, we could then replace some of these other micro measures with something more global. Now that's at least right now kept some people at the table or maybe interested. I don't know though once we get into it whether that will be enough. But I just wondered from your perspective, what are, I mean, we could lose a huge opportunity here with the triple aim if we let that part fall off for clinical care. So what are some strategies, given what you said, to keep healthcare at the table on those measures or that focus? What I, what I would suggest is we start with the determinants of health model, okay, and say what are a couple of key indicators of determinants of health. Yes, we need a, some clinical, but that's, that's 10 or 20 percent. What else should we add to get it more robust? I would then say, what are intermediate outcomes that we think that we can track that are, that are meaningful in terms of disease burden, but also patient-perceived quality of life, right? So I think if we establish a framework with certain domains and then say, okay, let's just have a uh, uh, a, a, a starting toolkit of measures which get beyond the clinical measures and start addressing these other dimensions will at least have a start. So that's, that is my thought. So it, it, my feeling about it, my, part of my feelings about this were shaped when you know, I would go around a few years ago to some of the most progressive um, practices, the practices that were really large, they looked like ACOs should look, and they were very far-sighted in their interest in prevention and the community. And, and, and they were doing innovative things, and I said to them, you know, would you invest in, would you actually invest in prevention in your community knowing that um, if you worked on healthier conditions in the community, your patients would be, uh, would be less likely to be coming in and, uh, with expensive um, uh, symptoms? And they said, you know, pretty much consistently across the board, no. If you say to us that we should be putting money into a community when we only have a certain market share, we don't think that's fair. Why should a certain group of providers or, or ACOs pay for something where all the other insurers benefit from it? And all the, we only have 20%. Why should we invest 100%? If you made all of us do it, then that would be fair. So, so I actually think some of, I think part of what we may need to do is define what are the characteristics of a system that would make sense. I actually don't think it's voluntary. I think it needs to be consistent, that there should be some consistent standards that apply to all providers from a regulatory perspective. How you get there, you know, you can, you can struggle over. I think that they should have some of the characteristics that Jim was just mentioning in terms of uh, activities that are measurable, if not outcomes that are measurable, activities that are concrete and measurable that represent significant interest in areas that have been determined to be, to address significant um, um, health concerns for particular communities. But, you know, my own view is it'll never get up to scale if it's voluntary. It'll just be, you know, very uneven and, uh, and the good systems will do good work and the other ones will will do things that are in a limited definition of self-interest. So, so I would say struggle to find some consistency, some, some characteristics, and then think about how you get them so that you can actually get it to be system-wide and, um, and long-term rather than just uh, episodic and uh, uneven. One, one more thought. In addition to the measures, what measures should we use? There's the issue of the system for reporting on those measures at a granularity that gets at the, the, the level of, of the system that we're trying to hold accountable. And, and that is a non-trivial issue in terms of how do you actually get the information without placing an impossible burden on, 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 on the, the provider community. Or the, anyway. Can I just mention a couple of that we thought of, uh, just to give you some examples. Well, one example we thought of was you, you, that 
that there should be a model that says for every a certain percentage of patients within your ACOs, there's a community health worker or educator. That that's a model, that it's a formula, that you, you actually say, okay, that patient population, certain demographics, okay, then you have to have certain number of providers. Other measures we thought should be, uh, uh, you have to um, meet um, systematically with your local health departments, and you have to jointly come up with the health department in a priority initiative that you invest in. But where it's, it's more than just saying, you know, we want you to consult with, it actually you have to show you met, and you have to show that the local health department said this was a priority based on the, and that you agreed with that, and that you came up with a, a concrete uh, response. So it, those, that, that's what I'm talking about in terms of a measure. It's not a measure in like a 15-minute thing. It's more like part of your license says you have to do this. Check yes or no. You met with the health department. They said we're working on obesity. You agreed. You'd invest in their campaign around healthy San Diego or whatever. Get well, Get well San Diego. But, but very concrete and specific in that way. Thank you. If I can chime in with a perspective as well, actually. Just two quick points. Um, one around uh, the idea of health-adjusted life expectancy and the second around um, an expanded denominator approach. Uh, so, so the first point, which is something that um, folks in New York, uh, Nick Stein, as well as uh, Steve Teutsch in LA County have really um, tried to explore operationally is uh, talking about what uh, Jim is saying, is combining some um, prediction of mortality with patient reported measures of quality of life as the summary metric of health. Um, and I think the key there is that it actually has to be meaningful for the individual, even though it's a population health measure. And I think that's why we haven't achieved traction with metrics thus far. Um, the second point is, is uh, kind of akin to what Debbie was talking about in the inside out model, which is w we have a very sophisticated measurement system in, in healthcare. Um, if we can start to push the boundaries of that uh, toward the community, I think that's an effective way to go about the problem that you're talking about. And one potential way of doing it is this expanded denominator idea, which I learned about through uh, Neil Coleman at the Institute for Family Health, also in New York. The idea is that if you have a population of diabetics, you don't just measure the folks who you know are actually captured in your healthcare system, who come to the doctor regularly and actually get their A1C checked. You, you um, follow those measures over time for people who come into your emergency rooms or your urgent care settings only, and you compare those two sets of metrics, one for the people who you know are captured in the healthcare system and the other uh, for, for folks who are more on the margin of the system. Great. Next question, please. Yeah, George Isham, uh, Health Partners, Minneapolis. Um, so follow on the same, same sort of question. Um, uh, around measurement, uh, and I, I guess, John, the, the, the finding that uh, you talked about with respect to asking this group to produce some community population health measures um, and not being able to do that is, a, is an important finding. And, uh, and I think you properly answered uh, a number of it with the last question, but I'm specifically wondering what the role of government is to, to make the success of the of this new legislation, both government at the federal level, government at the state level, government at the local level, in terms of creating that kind of metric that uh, in collective impact, if you look at that writing, is called for in terms of giving a, a guidepost. If you look at uh, even what we've heard today from Steve Shortell, uh, his bold proposal relies upon you know, that sort of metric and measurement. And we've already had conversations in the round table around that. So we've heard a lot about in, in this panel about private delivery systems and their roles and so forth. What about government? What, 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 what's the missing element here in terms of what their responsibility is in terms of that total population uh, metric, in terms of doing something you just were talking about? Can I share with you um, the evaluation framework, even though we try not to call it that anymore because evaluation, the term evaluation scares people. But if I had been listening to, to Jim, it sounds like our evaluation framework. So I just share with you the five domains and the ten top indicators, but what feeds up into those are other uh, uh, 
in, not indicators, but measures across our various systems, our programs, and also our community partners. So we do have that collective impact. So we've created logic models for the key areas where we want to uh, achieve outcome. And we've identified even down to the employee level so that they can see how they feed into this kind of critical pathway, if you will, to get that ultimate um, uh, desired outcome. But it comes with also the buy-in from the community partners that are working with you. And so we've had to vet this whole process with community partners, with stakeholders. And if they're bought in, and even with the recognition process, we make it a condition, well, it is a condition, they have to achieve at least one policy in the three behavioral areas, or they have a historical uh, background of working with the Health and Human Services Agency, they can become a let's move city. We create those conditions by which they can uh, achieve uh, recognition so they can become a, a live well San Diego entity or partner. So it's built in that way, but we, are, we have staff that are working through these logic models so people can see where they, people, not just people, our staff and our stakeholders can see where they fit in. If they're contractors, it will be built into, we're actually looking at uh, pro forma language so that it's included in uh, the contract, contracts when they go out for uh, RFPs, they go out for procurement processes. So there's multiple layers to build that in, but that's how we have attempted to do it in San Diego. My inclination would be to say that uh, government does have uh, a role at the table, um, uh, maybe uh, uh, in, uh, in part helping to convene with, with uh, providers. Uh, and by government, I, I actually think, uh, my inclination is to think that the public health uh, entities at the local, state, and federal level c can play a critical role. I, I would guess, for example, if you charged local uh, or state health commissioners with convening groups in their state to identify what would be um, a short list of uh, population measures uh, that uh, could be embedded within to either hospital licenses or ACOs. I think they, I, I think probably health departments would rise to that occasion um, and come up with some uh, creative um, approaches to doing that as well as the specific identifiers based upon some of the methodologies we've talked about. But I think it's a convening role. It's a convening role that, that's best done by folks that are very familiar with what the, the, um, the measures are for, best measures are for population health. I'd like to offer a, 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 uh, a hopeful uh, observation. The pioneer ACOs are experimenting with, the, uh, some of them, with an enhanced health risk appraisal tool which has uh, information on obviously patient risk factors and, and self-reported outcomes. They're finding that this information is very helpful to them, not just in tracking what's happening on the, you know, the population health, but in the uh, management of the population and identifying people who, 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 need, uh, who need care. So my, my experience in operating systems is uh, that the, the people who are collecting the information have to find value in it. Or, or say it's helpful if, they, if, they, if it's a value add for them as well. So trying to identify measures that are useful for our purposes, but also useful for the purposes of the, the people who have to manage the, the, the patients uh, is a win-win. I just wanted to add that in our work with um, CMMI, I think they've done a good job in terms of trying to get us to actually, to your point, George, to get us to focus on you know, the measures. And so for our... Um, award, we, um, we, I mentioned one that we're looking at, which is the, um, in, it's more of an activity one that, we, you know, our process measure, but it's looking at increasing the number of children reached by implemented policies and systems and environmental change that support asthma-related child well-being from, you know, a baseline of zero to 50,000. So, I mean, that's one, one that we were looking at. The other one that, um, we uh, are also looking at is school days missed um, as, a, as a population me measure. So I, I do think that 
CMMI is, is focused on the right thing by having us focus on these types of measures. And so I think there will be a, a further contribution, especially in this next round, which does have a focus on children and population health. Next question, please. Good afternoon. Thank you very much. Very interesting discussion. My name is Lawrence Deaton. I'm at the George Washington University School of Medicine and Health Sciences. I'm thinking a lot these days about educating health care providers about public health and population health. So this discussion is very exciting and as I'm getting into thinking about um, all the transformation that's going on because uh, of the ACA and other, other forces, uh, I'm, I'm getting worried uh, that uh, the, the health care providers and I, you know, doctors, nurses, pharmacists, uh, uh, physicians, assistants, community health workers, everybody, uh, are we training them today in a way that they'll be prepared and be able to be partners as opposed to obstacles in this implementation? And so uh, a comment really, uh, that's a comment for the panel, but also maybe a question for the panel and for the whole round table to consider what is the ideal training we need for health, the whole healthcare provider team to be um, advocates and partners in this as opposed to, I'll use the term obstacles and I don't, I think we all understand the, the barriers that are there. And, and it, it, it's in my thought process, it's not just the education. It's, it's not what we just provide them in their training, but it's also the accreditation of schools of nursing and medicine and osteopathy. It's also the state licensure boards and what the standards are that they have. And then I come back to the very powerful uh, presentations from this morning from the community groups and are those community groups saying to their states, this is what we want in terms of the accreditation standards for our doctors, our nurses, our pharmacists in our state. And so are we thinking about this whole cycle and the role of the provider and the provider team in making this successful? I think that's an excellent question and um, one that we've been grappling with because, oh, I'm sorry, because we are, uh, a part of us is a, a big health system. So um, in, in working with our own doctors, one of the things we've done with our CMMI grant is um, taken, taken a clinical team out into the community and it was eye-opening. So I think that part of it is the training that you're, you're talking about that I think needs to be more formal. Um, in, in terms of being a part of the um, education system, but the other is experiencing it and, 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 and taking the teams of clinicians and uh, professionals into the community to kind of observe and see. It was, it was really eye-opening for our teams. Before um, coming to work for CROP, I worked at a Medi-Cal managed care organization in Kern County. and. Um, my uh, top three health education uh, activities were nutrition education, weight management, and asthma. And um, the nutrition, uh, the weight management was adolescent, um, pediatric, and adult. And the number one consulting advice that physicians were giving um, the members were walk in the evenings. And it was walk in the evenings in, in the absence of really understanding the environmental context of the neighborhoods where these um, patients were living, right? And so having um, um, physicians then better understand that, um, I think, would have played a huge role in their advocacy about what they could do um, for that patient. And I think that our healthcare providers are the front line of witnessing what is the devastation of um, the obesity epidemic and diabetes and the preventable illnesses. And so where I haven't seen as much engagement and where I think would, would be of tremendous value is to have them come and tell those stories and share with decision makers um, in their advocacy for trying to create healthier communities. So in, in two examples of the Valley where that's worked, um, we had a public health um, nurse who eventually became the public health director, and she was case managing a child that was uh, under three years old and weighed close to 100 pounds. And um, that child lived in an apartment that had no um, refrigeration or stove top. And there was nothing that she could do in terms of continuing education to those parents that were going to alleviate the circumstance for that child. And it wasn't until she was able to get that child into a home where it had a backyard, had stove, had refrigeration, where that child's environment was changed that eventually that child's um, weight began to change and they grew into it and it's, you know, um, healthier. 
We have um, a, bari a bariatric surgeon um, in Fresno who was starting to perform weight management surgeries on adolescents and really just became frustrated by the whole dilemma. And she is our, our biggest advocate now in trying to do school um, re reform, school wellness reform, and is a huge advocate around um, the nutrition and the beverage environment changes that need to happen. And she has been such an asset in helping us communicate to um, school board and decision makers about why this needs to change. And um, so I think that th those partnerships, both the residents as well as um, uh, providers telling that story becomes much more powerful in creating change. I, I would just add that I, I think that your focus on uh, training and taking, having a critical eye about the training programs that we currently have and whether or not they're too focused on, uh, on only looking at the, uh, the patient sitting in front of them and making a diagnosis and treating a particular illness, I, I, think, that, I, I think that's a, um, a wise observation. I, I work now at a university with a nursing school, a pharmacy school, PA school, et cetera, and I think that there is an interest in in, in taking a, a critical eye to the, the curricula and deciding whether or not there need to be greater efforts to both get people out into the communities while they're in training, but also to change the actual content of the, the training itself so that the larger picture and the ecological system uh, model that we've, we've talked about today is part, is incorporated into uh, the curricula. I would just say that the issue of training applies not just to providers, but to a wide range of stakeholders in, 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 this, in this initiative. Uh, I think when each time that CMI has surveyed its awardees on, on needs and sort of places that feel weak, population health has usually come out at the top of the list. The latest was when we had the State Innovation Model Awards. Uh, I think CDC did a poll of you know, what people wanted help on, and again, how to, how to approach, how to think about population health and, and community health improvement I was at the top of the list. My observation has been that in the past few years when someone has come to one of our hospital community benefit programs with a master's in public health, these programs really soar. They really move from random acts of kindness to really strategically looking at how could we put our resources the best. <clears throat> and they, they teach others within our organizations. So I wish we could just populate um, uh, 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 our organizations with people with that good, solid public health background. Uh, before we get there, uh, we're looking at ways that we can take advantage of public health uh, training educational programs that HRSA and others offer uh, and bring that into our organizations. <clears throat> so if it's not part of the basic training, how can we get that expertise to the existing practitioners? It's a great question. <clears throat> Edging up on 4.30, so uh, Martha, you have the privilege of the last question. Thank you. So um, this is perhaps a little bit of a zinger. Um, you know, I've been thinking a lot about the um, community health needs assessment and the hospital arms. And I've been thinking about Steve Brill's potent article in Time magazine about what's going on in hospitals and how canny they have been in trying to keep themselves fed and watered. And I begin to worry a little bit about what the objective is exactly in having hospitals do community health needs assessments that gives a message to a community that the hospital is the central place where health is thought about and formed. And I wonder, perhaps this isn't the intent for ACA, perhaps it's a sort of self-study kind of issue for the hospitals, but I think that this is very challenging to think about whether the rich get richer in this setting and get to call the shots, or whether there's something that sort of happens more fundamentally at the community level and through the public health infrastructure. So I wonder if people have any observations or, or reassurances for me in that regard. Well, the incentives are tough, and I think many people have, have talked about moving from a fee-for-service, which I think was what Stephen Brill's article really was about, it going to the max and, and what the implications are <clears throat> to a more population health <clears throat> excuse me, orientation. Some hospitals have found that it's definitely in their self-interest uh, to look at population health. One of our uh, large systems in California is looking at ambulatory 
sensitive conditions of the uninsured population and looking at how can we back up, how can we keep people from coming to our emergency rooms and being admitted to our hospitals with conditions that are preventable. Um, and the answer is usually working in pri with primary care uh, and with prevention. So I think a lot of it has to do with, it, with incentives. Um, and it is countercultural to, I think, the way hospitals have performed before. Um, but there are many people within our organizations who are very excited about the, pr the prospect of working towards healthier people, not just taking care of sick people. There's a, a general concern about uh, this issue when you think about accountable care organizations versus accountable uh, care communities. Uh, and so uh, I think that the, the initiative to say how do we, again, uh, work, move towards more of a community-based orientation for these interventions uh, is, a, is, is something that we should be very mindful of. I just have one last comment. If, if we think about the community uh, health needs assessments as an opportunity as opposed to uh, looking at the antithesis of that, in any system, operational excellence, I, I feel, is important, and it's an opportunity if you're going to strategic, conduct strategic planning, you need to know where your gaps are and where you need to improve. And I just see it as an opportunity for the hospitals to identify those gaps and, and to contribute to population health, but in working in collaboration with the public health departments. I think that's really a key um, feature that while it's stated in the legislation, the operationalization of that I think is where we are going to have problems. Well, I think it is a challenge that operational operationalizing that particular guidance is. is but I still look at it as an as an opportunity, and both sides have to be willing to work together so that they can because there's a mutual goal here. Public health departments have to. Uh, conduct community need, community health assessments for accreditation. So there should be a way that they can do them somewhat together and mutually benefit. I think this this question is emblematic of of our discussion as a whole uh, of such a um, a deep question to which we uh, have various perspectives and. Uh, the beginnings uh, toward answers, but certainly much more dialogue to come. Um, and with that, I just want to say a very warm thank you to all the panelists for uh, for stimulating that discussion. I'm handing it off to George Isham. <laughs>